Hi guys, I'm back to talk about um, atmospheric pollution. Um, and so let me share my screen and we'll hit it. Okay, so uh, we've talked a lot about the atmosphere already um, in the context of kind of basic atmospheric function as it relates to energy and as it relates to climate and climate change. Um, but of course, there's many other kinds of components that can get into the atmosphere that can have health and environmental impacts um, as well. So the focus of this lecture is not so much on climate change impacts, although there is a lot of overlap between things that create sort of health um, problems, environmental problems, and also create um, climate change issues. Um, but we're going to focus on those other kinds of contaminants in the air. So first of all, when we start to think about um, atmospheric pollution, it's kind of um, unique um, in the context of some other kinds of contaminants um, that we are potentially using and spreading around our environment because our air is such a globally shared space. The molecules that end up in our atmosphere travel very quickly from country to country, from continent to to continent, from land to ocean, and back and forth. And so when we are polluting in one place, we are not only impacting the people and the environment in that location, but we are making decisions that impact environments and people all across the world. Um, so I'm gonna show you this quick um, kind of NASA simulation about the movement of aerosols. So aerosols are tiny little kind of liquid contaminant um, pieces or solid um, particles that get suspended in the air. And let me show you this video real quick here. Do, 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 do. Um, so you can see this is like a quick um, movement of air and the date is on the bottom right. So you can see how quickly um, some of this stuff is moving around, the different colors um, are different kinds of materials that are moving in the air. Um, so like, for instance, I know the tan um, color is like dust, little particles that get blown up off the desert and that might be natural dust or that also might be dust that contains different kinds of pesticides or other chemical contaminants. Um, the whites are um, kind of contaminants that are coming off industrial production in places like Europe, um, East Asia and North America. Um, the blues are salts. Um, that are out over the ocean. Um, and so you can see how quickly there's a big sharing of all the different kinds of materials that get in our atmosphere. And this in some cases is good. Um, these materials can help bring life um, to places um, outside where they would ordinarily exist. Um, but also this is a problem when we get different kinds of contaminants in the atmosphere and they can quickly move from one place to the next. Um, so, with that being said here, can I move to the next slide? Mm, I don't want to watch any more videos. I want to move to the next slide. Okay, so... This is Bill Putman. I'm a oh, climate scientist at wait a minute. NASA's Goddard Space Flight Center. What you're looking at... Okay, we're not going to look at that. Sorry. Sorry. Okay, so, um, anyway... Um, on the West Coast, for instance, we are very connected with what's going on in China. Um, there's a lot of um, industrial production that goes on in China, a lot of burning of coal, or coal to make energy in China. Um, also other East Asian countries, um, Vietnam, Japan, um, Korea are big kind of industrial engines. And what we see is that as air um, moves from East Asia across the Pacific Ocean and then lands on the West Coast, it can carries, carries a lot of contaminants with us. And we can track these contaminants by looking at isotopes, which is something we mentioned in the first part of the class. We said that different um, elements have um, basically a unique number of protons and then within elements that have that same number of protons, they can also have a different number of neutrons that give them slightly different weights. And so the weight of that element is kind of its isotopic signature. And in China um, or in other parts of East Asia, they have lead that has a weight of 208, which is a little bit different than some of the 207 weight lead that we see in coal reserves in the Americas. And so what we can see is when coal that contains this lead contaminant is burned in China in power plants, 
um, and it moves across um, towards the Americas, we can see that um, this has a source that is not coming from um, the energy production that we're doing in the United States. And like for disclaimer, we are also burning coal in the United States to make energy, which is also polluting. Um, but it's interesting that we can actually kind of track um, where this kind of pollution is coming from and see kind of what a globalized um, atmospheric pollution situation we're in. Um, one recent study found that as much as 29% of the lead on the West Coast is East Asian in origin. So that shows you just how much of this material is coming. And then of course, having health and environmental impacts here. Um, another interesting set of studies that's been done is looking at ice cores in places like Antarctica. So a place that's pretty remote compared to the places where we think a lot of industrial production is taking place. And what they can actually see in these ice cores is that they can see the atmospheric pollutants that have been um, kind of captured um, in the ice cores over time and the little tiny bubbles of ice or bubbles of air inside the ice. And so this particular um, photograph is showing somebody holding an ice core. And then it's showing on the right, um, a kind of a diagram of the different kinds of contaminants that they found in the ice cores and in the bubbles from different years. And so you can see how certain things in blue, those are volcanic eruptions. You can see gold rush impacts. Um, of course, we know that stirred up a lot of mercury. This particular study was looking at mercury. Um, we can see manufacturing during World War II, and then we can see kind of the general trend of a lot of it, um, manufacturing um, kind of post-industrial revolution. Um, so this particular study is looking at mercury, but again, we can see this kind of thing for um, all different kinds of contaminants, and not just in the place um, where those contaminants are being used or released, but in places in far-flung locations of our world. Okay, so um, that kind of brings us to the introduction of an idea, which is the difference between a point and a non-point source emission of pollution. So we know that once pollution gets in the air, it moves around a lot, and this would also be true if once it gets in the water, it moves around a lot. Um, but we can try to kind of go back and figure out where the pollution is coming from, and that has kind of helpful management or policy implications. And in some cases, kind of tracing this pollution back to a source is pretty easy. And that's when we see a point source, so like a smokestack from a electricity power plant. We can kind of see directly where pollutants are getting into the air. Now, it might be more difficult to stop that pollution if we still want have, have access to that energy, which is kind of a important, but a di different question. But we can at least identify where the pollutants are coming from, and then we can work on the next important process of figuring out how to limit the release of those contaminants. However, a lot of pollution comes from what are called non-point sources. So these would be like areas that essentially you can't point to, like big agricultural areas, like the Central Valley of the United States. There's an enormous amount of pollution that comes um, up into the air and also gets into the water off these large expanses that are managed in such a way as to release um, different kinds of chemicals and sediments into the air. And we can't exactly go to one place and stop what's going in one particular place because there's not one point where this pollution is coming from, but it's um, being released in a much more diffuse way. So these are more difficult to regulate and more difficult to manage, but also important to be aware of and understand in the context of pollution. Um, okay, so your textbook kind of talks about some of the main contaminants that are um, unsurprisingly listed in the United States' uh, Clean Air Act. Um, so the Clean Air Act kind of set out um, the different kinds of contaminants that it thought were most prevalent and most harmful. And so um, it has been adapted over time. The original Clean Air Act was written in the early 60s. And then kind of the main bulk of the Clean Air Act that we depend on today was written in the 1970s. But there have been updates in the 1990s and then even updates more recently relative to carbon pollution. But basically, the Clean Air Act defined what it called conventional pollutants. So again, these were the pollutants that the government, in its research, determined were the most prevalent and most harmful at the time when the bill was written in 1970. And it lists these as particulate matter, um, nitrogen oxides, 
um, sulfur dioxide, lead, carbon monoxide, and ozone. And then ozone is something that's often created as a secondary contaminant from the release of volatile organic carbons. So we'll talk about that in a minute. Um, and then it also makes mention of what it called unconventional pollutants. So these were also things that were of grave concern, maybe particularly harmful, but were not at the time that this original um, legislation was written in the 1970s considered to be as prevalent. Um, and so these are things like mercury, asbestos, PCBs, and then now we have added things like carbon dioxide and methane um, because we, of their um, impacts to global warming. So anyway, we're going to kind of go through and dissect um, the different conventional and then some of the unconventional pollutants as well to understand kind of where they come from and what are the potential impacts of these different kinds of pollutants. Um, okay, before we do that, I just want to share um, this graph, which I think is very interesting. This is something that is published by the EPA and it's a couple years out of date now, but the trends would similarly um, be on the same trend. And basically what it shows is that we have had an enormous success of being able to enact this Clean Air Act and clean up our air significantly compared to what we were seeing in the late 60s and 70s. And at the same time, not see that we've had really dramatic countrywide limitations to our economic growth. So a lot of times people pit environmental regulation as something that is kind of um, untenable um, to the business community, to the economic um, growth of our country and sustainability of our country, when in fact that's really not the case that we have seen over time. I don't mean to say that there aren't individual losers that happen when certain regulations get passed because that's unfortunately the nature of what happens. But for the most part, people are able to adapt and grow and they're able to make sometimes better and stronger businesses and economies um, and industries that are able to um, keep our air clean, for instance, and make the products um, that we hope for them to um, produce. So some of the things that it shows in this particular graph are a reduction in the six conventional pollutants down 69% from the Clean Air Act passage in 19, the 1970s. Um, CO2 emissions are up 27%. Um, energy consumption is up 45% um, while the aggregate emissions are down. So we're doing a better job at creating more energy with less pollutants. Our population is up, so we have more people demanding more goods and transportation and energy while we're still able to keep pollutants down. Vehicle miles traveled up 172% and gross domestic product up 238%. So I think this is just a nice way to visualize that we don't always need to consider that over the long run, environmental regulation is at odds with industry. Um, and hopefully we hope we will live in a society where both these things can um, coexist. Okay, so the first um, conventional contaminant is particulates. Um, so particulates come from things that are um, shown in this graph at the bottom left. So things like we're burning wood, which we do a lot of in a place like um, Plumas County. That's a huge one um, in places like California with lots of rural areas and lots of forest. Um, industrial processing is a big one, road dust, um, fires, vehicles on the road, um, kind of kicking up dust, um, off-road equipment, fossil fuel combustion, waste disposal, et cetera, et cetera. So there's a lot of different reasons that we might have dust being kicked up in the air. Um, and this is a concern for people that have different kinds of respiratory issues or asthma, which are unfortunately quite common in places like California and especially California Central Valley that has big problems with particulate matters in the atmosphere. And um, the government actually regulates two different kinds of particulate matter. It regulates what's called PM10 and PM2.5. So PM2.5 are the smallest sized particles, less than 2.5 microns or millionths of a meter. And these are the things that are most kind of insidious or most um, detrimental to your respiratory health. And then PM10 are sometimes easier to see, but they're actually often not quite as dangerous for your health, though they're also not good. And so a lot of times you'll see um, different graphs or maps showing different kinds of PM2 or PM 
um, 10 um, kind of contamination levels in the air. So this particular graph is showing the United States and it's PM, particulate matter 2.5 levels in air by county. Um, and so you can see that we have some hot spots um, in places like Appalachia um, and some of the kind of industrialized classic steel manufacturing and energy, energy manufacturing um, places in the east. And then we can also see that California Central Valley is kind of notorious um, for having kind of high levels of this particulate matter. That's a combination between energy production, lots of agricultural um, production that goes on in this area. So lots of non-point point source pollutions, lots of traffic. And then also they just have a kind of a geography such that that area is kind of trapped by mountains. Um, and so the mountains make it difficult for air to kind of move through that area and clear itself out. And so it gets kind of stuck with a lot of the pollution that it makes or pollution that might be blown in from coastal cities, um, places like LA. And then it's kind of getting a double dose of pollution that's not being kind of blown out and the air is not getting cleaned. So particulate matter is something that's concerning. It's something you can often see and um, it's something that we want to do a better job of cleaning up. Um, places like China have had huge problems with particulate matter in the atmosphere. Um, uh, this is um, associated with all the kinds of things that we've already mentioned that can create particulates in um, the United States. Um, they also have had struggles with other kind of contaminants that we're going to talk about later, things like mercury, um, NOx, and SO2. But um, a lot of times you see people in China, even before this COVID outbreak, walking around with masks on, and that's to kind of try to protect their lungs from the contaminants that have been in their air. And this is kind of a classic um, trade-off between huge gross domestic product growth and industrial produce, production, um, kind of at the cost of environmental and societal health. And um, in this particular one report that I was reading, which is a few years out of date, but this picture is still something that you would be able to see. Um, and it's reporting that the level of fine particulate matter or PM 2.5 in Harbin, an area in Northern China this week, reportedly reached 1000 micrograms per cubic meter, which exceeds the World Health Organization's daily target of 40 micrograms per cubic meter and for reference, the US's EPA limit is 12 micrograms per cubic meter. So they're seeing a thousand or hundreds of times what we would consider a legal limit in the United States. And that's the kind of um, environmental quality that they're dealing with in this particular country. And so um, in the last decade, they've been getting a lot of pressure about this, both from their own citizens and from governmental organizations. And they have been putting in place some plans to try to clean their air up, but they have a lot of work to do. Okay, so um, the next group of contaminants that I want to talk about are what's often called NOx. So NOx is nitrogen and oxygen, and then the X means that there's different combinations. Sometimes it's NO2 or NO3, um, so different kind of versions of these nitrogen and oxygen um, compounds. And then sulfur dioxide, SO2, is commonly found in that form. And these are things that are um, produced by the burning of coal. So they're kind of contaminants in coal that get released into the atmosphere. And then also from um, the tailpipe of your car when we burn fuel oil. Um, NOx in particular is a common kind of byproduct that ends up getting into the atmosphere. Um, and then also with the production of synthetically based nitrogen fertilizer, um, there's a lot of NOx that's released that way. So um, there's a variety of different kinds of concerns associated with the release of these contaminants. Um, one is what I think we've mentioned in here before is called eutrophication. So the idea of eutrophication is when different kinds of nutrients, things that plants need to grow, get into the water kind of above a natural level, they can set off these big algae blooms. And these big algae blooms can basically um, starve the aquatic ecosystems from the nutrients that other kinds of organisms need. So the 
the algae grows at a really fast rate. Sometimes the algae has toxic byproducts, um, but in all cases, it's blocking light and blocking resources from other organisms. And then after the algae comes, a wave of bacteria come in to break down the algae and they um, use up lots and lots of the oxygen that's in the water. And so we have an oxygen depletion associated with eutrophication. And this is definitely the kind of thing that we can see when we're getting extra nitrogen um, that's ending up first in our air, but then it might be falling down and landing and getting into the water. Um, both of these things can also create um, health impacts to humans when inhaled. And then they're also both greenhouse gases that can contribute to global warming. Um, and finally, they're both attributed to the creation of acid rain. So when both NOx and SO2 combine with water, H2O in the air, they can form nitric and sulfuric acid. And so then the rainwater that's falling down can actually have an acidic property um, and just actually all rain has a slightly acidic capacity because of mixing with carbon dioxide in the air, um, but it can become more acidic and then it can fall down and it can damage plant tissues and animals um, and it can create a lot of environmental problems. So um, in 1990, the Clean Air Act, one of the amendments of the Clean Air Act set a cap on SO2 and um, NOx or NOx emissions from power plants in a hope to limit some of the acid rain problems. Um, that they were having a lot throughout the 1970s and 80s, particularly in places like the East Coast. Um, and um, what they found was that they have been able to decrease um, the emissions of these things, decrease the rate of um, uh, acid rain that's being produced, and at the same time, overall using technology and improvements, um, increase the amount of energy that we're getting out of um, these different power plants. So this little graph is showing um, acid rain dropping since the 1980s and then you're seeing kind of a precipitous drop um, in the emissions of some of this SO2 and NOx um, right at the 1990 year and then at the same time you're seeing that that hasn't had to come at the compromise of energy efficiency and production. Okay. I'm on my computer for a second. Okay, moving right along, lead. I think many of us know that lead is not something that's healthy for us, um, right? When you go to the gas station, there are signs that say like unleaded gas. Um, we want unleaded paint. We heard a lot about the issues with lead getting into water through pipes in Flint, Michigan a few years ago. Uh, but unfortunately, lead is something that's in the environment around us still. Um, it can become released into the environment through different kinds of mining practices, um, smelting practices, so different kinds of metal work and industrial metal processing practices, like making aluminum, making sheet metal, um, making steel. Um, it was used to be added um, to gasoline to try to improve um, fuel efficiency, although it's now been taken out as we better understand the health impacts. And it was also in the past added to paint, although now that's not true anymore. However, of course, there's a lot of old paint still on homes um, in in places where people could come in contact with this lead um, today. So lead is kind of particularly scary because it has impacts to our nervous system and our brain function. Um, and so fortunately, back in the 1980s, there were a lot of bans on lead additives. Um, and this kind of made people much more aware and then made people much less exposed to these kinds of contaminants. And this is good news. We've seen a big drop in blood level, blood lead levels in children um, from the 1990s um, until recently. So this graph on the bottom is showing um, estimated number of children with blood lead levels over five micrograms um, per liter or for deciliter for 10 liters of blood. And you can see how high it was um, back in the late 90s compared to today. So this is another kind of um, win for kind of an environmental um, regulation standpoint, although we still have work to do. Okay, now next one, carbon monoxide, CO. This is very close to carbon dioxide, but just one oxygen bonded to the carbon, and so it gives it a different property. 
And um, this is created usually when we have incomplete combustion of fossil fuels. So our fuels are being burnt, um, like in our gas tanks. And most of the time that's producing carbon dioxide, but sometimes if the temperature isn't quite right, um, we'll get carbon monoxide instead. And when people and animals breathe in carbon monoxide, um, it kind of prevents them from being able to absorb the oxygen that they need. And so it can actually kill people. Um, so um, this is what happens if people like accidentally inhale too much from the exhaust pipe of their car, um, something like their oven. Um, these kind of tragic stories would be um, related to the inhalation of carbon dioxide and essentially suffocating as a result. So um, this is also something that can react with um, energy from the sun. So these are called photochemical reactions. And then it can turn into ozone. Um, it can react with oxygen, carbon dioxide, um, or other volatile organic compounds that we'll talk about in a minute. And it creates ozone, which is another compound we're gonna talk about next. And that is something that can contribute to smog, um, which is another um, kind of problematic pollutant. Okay, ground level ozone, we're getting there. Um, ground level ozone is this three oxygens that are bonded together. And as I just mentioned, this is usually a secondary pollutant. So it's not something where we're typically actually releasing ozone like from a power plant or from the exhaust pipe in our car, but it's something that's created um, as a photochemical reaction or photochemical alteration. So energy from the sun causes a chemical reaction between um, some oxygen, often volatile organic compounds, so different kinds of organic compounds that are released from our car, um, like parts of fuel that aren't completely combusted that have been released. And then they're reacting with things like carbon monoxide and they're becoming ozone. Um, ozone is also toxic to living organisms, including people, vegetation, fungi, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and they can also be an oxidant or an irritant. They can create rashes on skin um, and um, basically create health problems for us. So um, this is something that is undesirable. And um, it's also something that it's important to keep clear is not the same as the ozone that we have up in our stratosphere. So it, it is the same in that it's the same chemical compound, but as we learned before, there's different layers of the atmosphere. And when we have um, ozone up in our stratosphere, it is um, serving a different purpose to block UV radiation. It's far away from people. And so it's not creating health impacts. And so it's very important. And we want that ozone to stay there. And that's not true with the ozone that we see on the ground. Um, okay, I'm going to stop here for a second and then we'll finish the rest in the next video.